Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This session is entitled A Dialogue on the Exposome and Population Health for Environmental Justice. I am Dr. Chandra Jackson, an environmental epidemiologist and investigator at the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. I'm delighted to serve as the moderator for this much needed and exciting conversation. We have a fantastic set of expert panelists, and the purpose of this particular session is to identify frameworks and approaches across the entire spectrum of the research enterprise that can help us not only advance the science of environmental justice, but also actually address health inequities over the next 10 years. And so regarding the structure of this session, the panelists whose bios are on the workshop's webpage, They've been asked to provide background on their research and their perspectives on this topic in just five minutes. And we will spend the remainder of the time in dialogue surrounding a particular scenario related to environmental justice that I'll describe after the brief introductions. And um, I will incorporate questions from the audience during the conversation. So please, at any time, feel free to leave a question in the Q&A box, either directed to an individual or to the entire panel. And uh, with that context, we will start with the five minute introductions uh, with Dr. Aisha Dickerson, who is an assistant professor at the Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Dickerson. Thank you, Chandra. So as was mentioned, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the Bloomberg School of Public Health, but my research focuses on environmental risk factors for neurological disorders, primarily neurodegenerative and uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. I'll say that all of this started with the passion to provide children with the opportunity at a successful future, regardless of the background that they were born into. Um, the issue with all of that, however, though, is that we are exposed to a variety of environmental toxicants every day, not just at home, but also in school and at work, and this is across the life course. In my work, I started just looking at the general population, but what I realized early on is that there are areas, especially areas with marginalized populations and low-income communities that experience these exposures at a much greater rate. And so I started to focus my research um, within these groups. It's important though, when we're thinking about how to handle environmental justice, that we focus on solution-oriented procedures and that those solutions are research-based. So I don't even really need five minutes. I think uh, there are plenty of people who have a lot more to say, and I don't want to take any time away from them. Thank you, Dr. Dickerson. Um, Dr. Juarez has not been able to join us yet, so we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, and so Dr. Robert Wright, he's a professor at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and he will introduce his research background along with perspective. Thank you, Chandra, and thank you for the organizers for inviting me. I'm Bob Wright, I'm a pediatrician, I'm a medical toxicologist, uh, epidemiologist, and environmental scientist, and most recently I started writing a blog, so I guess I'm a blogger too, so I, I wear a number of hats. Um, I'm the PI of a human health exposure analysis resource targeted lab. Uh, this is part of the NIH's uh, really largest exposomics program. Uh, so I run the lab that does the targeted assays at Mount Sinai. I'm also a P30 core center director. Uh, and more recently, uh, I joined the CTSA at Mount Sinai, where I'm the lead of a exposomics and precision medicine function. Uh, this is a module that's designed to give educational workshops to both the community members and to academics on learning about environmental health and how to incorporate it into clinical medicine. Uh, so that's a very exciting new initiative that we started here. And I've been the PI of a longitudinal birth code in Mexico City for the last 15 years as well. Uh, my primary interest is how to intro introduce environmental health into clinical uh, research, but also how to use exposomics to discover uh, the underlying patterns of exposures that actually drive health inequities. So that's, I think that's all the time I need. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Dr. Wright. Our next speaker is Dr. Sokobi Wilson. He's an associate professor at the University of Maryland College Park. He'll now introduce his research background along with perspective. Yeah, sorry for joining 
join a little bit late. So um, um, Shakobi, I'm a um, full professor now, officially, I think. It'll be soon. Uh, at the University of Maryland College Park. Happy to be here today. So I, uh, I'm an environmental health scientist, uh, been a scientist for a while, uh, been doing environmental justice work for about 25 years. Uh, I direct the Center for Community Engagement, Environmental Justice and Health. So at the heart of what we do is in, I like to say, empowerment science, doing science to put the scientific tools into the hands of the people, doing science to other people, for the people, and by the people. And the idea is, is that um, there's a lot of extractive colonial science that's been done. As one of my community members would say, guinea pig science. And I don't support uh, guinea pig science, helicopter science. So the idea is we want to liberate folks from toxic trauma from the sacrifice zone. So I do a lot of work trying to address environmental racism, because environmental racism is the driver behind a lot of environmental justice, environmental classism. Uh, and so what we try to do is really get at the root causes, uh, and, but do applied action-oriented solution science. And so um, a lot of the work is using the community-based participatory research framework. Uh, I'm editor-in-chief of the journal um, Environmental Justice. We actually have a special issue out now on liberation science. Uh, I'm also a member of the EPA Scientific Advisory Board, a former member of EPA's National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, former member, board member of Community Campus Partnership for Health, and also currently a board member of the Citizen Science Association. So a lot of folks of, of our work is really around community science and making sure that um, that the science has real impact. When it comes to the research topics I work on, do a lot of work in helping to build hyper-local air quality monitoring networks uh, because the EPA monitoring networks are not really monitoring where pollution is. And so we have monitors, monitor networks in Chevrolet, Maryland, with building out monitors, monitor networks in New Jersey and South Ward, working with folks in Savannah, working with folks at, um, in Uniontown, Alabama, also in Charleston, do a lot of work around climate change and stormwater issues, do a lot of work building uh, mapping tools, screening tools like Maryland EJ Screen, do a lot of stuff. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking, but really about uh, doing research for action and, and research for solutions. So thanks for having me. Great. Our next and final speaker, if Dr. Juarez has not joined us, is Dr. Ami Zolta, um, and she is an associate professor at George Washington, soon to be Columbia University, and she'll also provide um, her research background along with perspective. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and um, I also don't need five minutes. I think a lot of the themes uh, of my work have, um, have been covered by um, the other panelists, but um, broadly, um, as mentioned, I'm an environmental health scientist uh, currently at George Washington University, Mopin School of Public Health, and starting June 1st, I'll be at Columbia University, Mailman School of Public Health in environmental health sciences, and um, I run the Arise EJ Lab, um, and you know, our mission is to help secure environmental justice and improve health equity through advancements in science, policy, um, communication and training the next generation leaders. Um, so hopefully I think one of the themes that we're gonna be talking about is doing good science is not enough to actually um, move us towards justice and equity. We have to do something with this science um, and that takes work, that takes innovation, that takes uh, community engagement. It cannot be an afterthought. Uh, some of my research right now looks at social structural stru factors, um, thinking a lot about intersectionality. So um, how do we integrate systems of power and oppression, especially their impacts on um, the lives of multiply marginalized um, people and communities into environmental health sciences, uh, both into um, identifying uh, modifiable risk factors as well as um, solutions. And um, I'm also equally, um, and so I do that work on I look at how racism and sexism shape beauty culture, consumer product use, chemical exposures, and the health of women and children across the life course. I'm equally committed to science communication, research translation, and training uh, scientists from historically excluded backgrounds. And in 2019, I created the Agents of Change and Environmental Justice Program, which seeks to empower um, emerging environmental justice leaders from historically excluded backgrounds in and science to reimagine solutions, solutions for a just and healthy world. Um, so our program, um, Agents of Change, seeks to increase diversity in environmental and climate sciences, spur innovation in um, environmental science and policy, and ex increase accessibility of scientific information um, for those communities that um, have historically been um, and currently are left out of decision making. 
Um, so I will I will stop there and um, I'll turn it back to you, Chandra. Thank you, Dr. Zelta and the rest of the panelists for the brief introductions. Regarding the scenario that's up for discussion, it's important that the audience knows that we've asked the speakers to consider um, that in Eastern North Carolina, there are largely African-American residential communities located near swine industrial livestock operations, and they've been producing air pollutants, including distressing uh, odorant emissions for decades now. And these communities are experiencing poor health outcomes, including clusters of cancer and neurodevelopmental disorders. And so we know that there are tools available like the cumulative impact assessments we've discussed earlier in the workshop, exposomics, and polygenetic risk scores also mentioned. And so we can leverage them to assess the most common types of cancer and chronic diseases. We also have a central database with comprehensive information on biomarkers of dietary, chemical, and population ex uh, pop pollution exposures, and um, it's accessible to the public. And so a task force has been formed, including policymakers and environmental scientists in hopes of working with the community to develop a plan for full remediation. Uh, and so keeping in mind that the purpose of this session is to identify the most useful frameworks, stakeholders and approaches, it would be great to start the conversation by having speakers walk us through the most potentially impactful and currently available approaches across the entire spectrum of the research enterprise. And that's from bench science, such as toxicology, but also population health, including implementation science. And so again, the purpose is to advance efforts for full remediation. Um, and note that the next question will actually be related to what will be available in the next 10 years. So would anyone like to um, start off the conversation and please use the raise hands function. Dr. Sakopi Wilson. I couldn't find a raise hand function, so I'm gonna, I just raised my, my, my hand. Uh, so let, I'll start off and I'll try to, I mean, let me be good here. So I did my dissertation on industrial hog farming in North Carolina. So this is very much in, in, in my, why, why am I up here twice? Do y'all see me twice? Okay, I see myself twice. Okay, <laughs> sorry. So, so I, I did my I did my dissertation on industrial hog farming. So, there's been a lot of research done on the um, air quality impacts of these operations on human health. A lot of work has been done by Dr. Steve Wing, who's no longer with us. He's been gone for about six years now, but he did that work looking at exposure to ammonia and hydrogen sulfide and the impacts as relates to um, um, immune function and also irritation of the throat using uh, case, control, case control studies. Also worked with his students looking at uh, asthma differences between children who go to uh, schools dairy hall case versus children that do not. And also looking at issues of uh, impacts uh, for occupational exposures and, and families when it comes to MRSA as well. So you've had, uh, you, you've had um, some ECPI um, studies done. You've had exposomic studies done, microbiomic studies done. That's the best way to say that. Um, and also other types of uh, innovative um, environmental assessment studies that have been done, even with the looking at water quality impacts too. So I'll just, uh, just to pass the mic and say, I'm saying there's a lot of work that's been already done on the assessment side. I think the need is on the solution side. Where's the science, implementation science that actually intervene when it comes to sustainable regenerative agriculture, when it comes to looking at the impacts of animal husbandry and what's happened to the animals, and also when it comes to other issues, now that you have emerging issues with bio biogas facilities, now they want to capture the methane from the lagoon systems to use that for energy, which leads to more entrenchment of the industry and not actually addressing the long-term problem of that particular industry in the communities. And also, they're starting to grow both chickens and hogs on the same farm. Um, not sure how smart that is, but there needs to be some research on that because of the whole issue of, you know, viruses and bacteria jumping from animals. So I would say research on that is more research there needs, needs to happen. And then also more research on the policy intervention side, because I would say I'm not a community member, but they would say, well, we've had a lot of research. Where's the, where's the solutions? Where are the solutions? Are? So I'll pass the mic. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Um, across the entire research spectrum? Are there opportunities? 
to advance uh, the realm of justice. I'd be happy to go next. I think Dr. Dickerson was actually next. Okay. She had it up before me. Oh, well, you also lifted your hand. Oh, she, she was up before me, though. So, Dr. Dickerson, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Wright. So, just thinking about the approaches that are available now versus what we had a few years ago, I was just explaining to a student during a meeting earlier today that now we can actually look at mixed exposures. I think one of the biggest issues with looking at environmental exposures and adverse health outcomes is that people would look at one thing at a time. Is it the lead? Is it the noise? Is it the odor? And so with these newer techniques, we can look at co-occurring and joint exposures. There are a lot of statistical methods like quantile G computation, where we can actually look at a collection of exposures and try to pick out a priority for what we should go for first. So when I think about how to make a policy change, it's hard to just go to a politician and say, we need to fix everything. We know that everything is bad, but when you're trying to explain to someone where money needs to be allocated to make a change, it's better to, to try to pick out a priority. And with these new methods that we have, we can actually pick out a priority. Not only can we do that, we can pinpoint what particular exposure coming from those hog farms has the biggest impact. So when you think about industries, the first thing they'll say is it's not us doing it. It's the McDonald's that you're eating and it's those pipes, it's, it's not the hog farm. But if you can use these methods to point out that yes, it is the hog farm, then that makes a, a stronger argument when you're trying to, to clean up those areas. I'll get a little more into trying to prevent them from placing the hog farm there in the first place, uh, but I'll wait till we get further in the discussion and I'll pass it on to Dr. Wright. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so, Roughly 20 years ago, I, I got involved in a Superfund site in Oklahoma. And, you know, it's actually closer to 25 years ago, and I was very young and, and very naive. And I went out there for the first time to an EPA meeting. And I started out with the thought, well, of course, they want the Superfund site cleaned up. And I was actually kind of astonished by the mixture of opinions. And it wasn't until afterwards I started to realize there are a lot of people who make their living off the, the activities that created the Superfund site. Uh, and some of this was uh, tribal land. So this was, uh, some of this was actually Bureau of Indian Affairs fault. They leased the land to a mining company. Um, but a lot of tribes were also using the mining waste and there were financial issues. And I think one of the things I've learned over the years is you have to factor in that nothing is ever unanimous and that there's going to be competing voices and we do need to listen to them. I'm, I'm certainly not advocating for not cleaning it up, but we're going to have to factor in that there will be factions, so to speak, within the community that may actually not even be for the cleanup for whatever reason. Superfund sites have a lot of financial and economic impacts on the community, including um, you know, loss of income in terms of property values. And there were actually a faction in this community that didn't want, in order to have the cleanup, you have to be labeled a Superfund site. And it would be nice if there were ways around that, because once you're labeled a Superfund site, property values plummet. And there's a economic impact across the community. And there's also this feeling of isolation because, you know, who's going to buy my house? I live in a Superfund site. And, and, there's all these social aspects that come to it. And actually one of the things we tried to study was the, the social impact of being a Superfund site or a site where there's toxic waste because the kids who lived there, the other towns when they would go play them and say a basketball game, they were called chat rats because mining waste is chat. And so there was actually a stigma attached to actually being the, at, living at this site. And there were assumptions that these kids were not going to be smart when they grew up and were never going to college. And it became almost this sort of foregone conclusion that I think a lot of these kids had. And I don't have a great answer to this, but I do think it's something we have to consider because sometimes we go in guns a blazing saying we're going to clean up without really listening to all the components uh, of the community and what their, what their concerns are. And I'll, I'll stop there. Great. Dr. Ami Zeltzer. 
Hi, thank you. So I'm just going to take us in a slightly different direction. Um, as Sokovia had mentioned, you know, we have a lot of data characterizing harm in these communities, and that this data actually goes back quite a long ways. I mean, I actually trained with Dr. Steve Wing, who took me to Eastern North Carolina as an undergraduate. I won't tell you how long ago that is, don't need to date myself, but it was a while ago. So the, you know, the evidence on, on the conditions there and their impact on the health and wellness of, you know, minoritized poor black and brown communities, you know, is, is well established. So I think where we, where we could, um, where we could use more scientific rigor is how do we take that evidence and that information and translate it to effective action? So, I mean, I think we think we know how to do this, but we actually don't have evidence-based practices, right? And I think that that shows in the fact that even um, if you look at kind of the body of community-based participatory research, and this was the subject of a review done and published in EHP by researchers at University of Arizona, I think last year, you know, in terms of how many of them have moved the needle on systemic change, um, it, it, it's very few, right? And there's a lot of barriers to that, including funding, you know, the kind of the cycle of our grants, et cetera, et cetera. But um, so I still don't think we have best practices, evidence-based practices on how to take the information we're generating and leverage it to create action and change, right? And because you know, there's a myriad of strategies. One is, you know, um, empowering um, those people that are living uh, in the area to use the information to advocate for change. Another is, you know, doing an educational campaign focused on local policymakers or health professionals. I mean, there's there's a wide range of things that one can do um, around, um, really around translating the science that we're doing to, to you know, to, to kind of create change. But I, I think we just kind of shoot from the hip uh, as opposed to kind of trying to take an evidence-based approach to this. And I do see an opportunity here for kind of implementation science. Um, and I, you know, I was part of that workshop that NIH organized, I think in February, focused on implementation science, um, especially for health equity and EJ. And um, I, I, you know, I think there are some tools there that, that can help us. I mean, from what I gathered in the implementation science uh, world, a lot of what they still study are interventions at the individual uh, level, like changes in diet and behavior and exercise. And there is still some work to be done in, in kind of adapting those tools towards uh, kind of studying the efficacy of policies and policy change. Uh, but um, I, I think there are some kind of promising and new opportunities there. Thank you. Considering promising and new opportunities, when we're considering leveraging emerging uh, multi-omic tools, I wonder about your thoughts regarding using them to further advance the cumulative risk assessments that we discussed earlier in the workshop. I envision, without being the expert in this area, being able to one day use omics to open up what was the black box in epidemiology to link exposures to the downstream health effects and in particular individuals or communities, which could really um, serve as a powerful tool in terms of environmental justice, because then it could um, make the case in terms of legislation, uh, litigation even, um, and regulation. And so I wonder your thoughts about the opportunities or challenges um, related to multi-omics advancing cumulative risk assessments that we've heard are already so powerful. I'll tell me real quick, I will make a couple, couple points. So I mentioned real briefly earlier that I'm on the EPA Science Advisory Board and we did have a cumulative impacts discussion at our last Science Advisory Board meeting. And just to, I, I wasn't able to participate in the workshop earlier, so I apologize for that. I'll just make a quick point. I think in general, when it comes to our science, I like to say our science is not keeping up with people's exposures. When you think about environmental justice, as you're probably raised today, folks have been exposed to multiple stressors and multiple agents across multiple media, across multiple pathways. So to have omics, to be succinct, to provide, to, to as you said, address that, that gap, 
I think is very, very important, whether it be as well as a cumulative exposure. So we, we have the tendency to conflate the terms, cumulative risk or cumulative impact. They are different, but they're related, right? So I think that's important. And to go back to the North Carolina example, uh, the, there were several lawsuits in the past three to four years where folks who live near the hog farms won their lawsuits. Now, previously they used tort law the, as well as the trespass of the gases, right? Uh, a, a nuisance, right? Trespass of the waste been sprayed on their yards, on their homes. You know, the way they, they won the lawsuits, they were able to show that through omics or through microbiome, they were able to show that uh, DNA of bacteria in the gut of the hogs was found on the top of their table in the house, was found in the kitchen, was found on the floor, was found in the bathroom, right? So they were able to win based on that kind of data, okay? So I think that's, there's power there. If you look at other EJ issues, if you're able to bring in omics, and as uh, Dr. Zoda mentioned, from an evidence-based approach, I think this is a powerful way to fill in that gap as it relates to cumulative risk. And then what we'll say is, to back to the EPA and some of our regulatory agencies, you need to be including this type of information into your cumulative risk assessment. Because so I would say right now, the EPA does a poor job of cumulative risk assessment, I think Dr. Uh, Dr. Dickinson said earlier, a single compound by compound, beyond, like pesticides with Native American uh, populations, they've done a little bit more in cumulative, but the cumulative risk assessment work with EPA ha hasn't been great. So I like to say is if you can use risk assessment, which has, you know, you have, you know, you have uh, uncertainty factors, why can't you do a cumulative? We could have already been using cumulative risk assessment, just to be honest. But I think the omics can help fill the gaps there. And then getting back again to the North Carolina example and, and go to Dr. Zola's point, and I'll, I'll pass the mic. I think one of the things you have to think about is the systems of the, the challenges and barriers. You have a right to farm act. That's a challenge and barrier. You have industry relationships with politicians in North Carolina, which is a challenge and barrier. You have uh, hog farm owners on the board of UNC Chapel Hill, challenges and barriers, right? So you actually have some real political challenges that can impact their ability, that have impacted their ability to actually address that problem in North Carolina and, and I think with the new dollars from the infrastructure bill as it relates to addressing some of the legacy pollution, to me, industrial hog farming is a legacy pollution issue. How can that money be activated in North Carolina to address the legacy pollution from industrial hog farming? I think it's a, that's a big question. And also, and also it's a big opportunity. I'll, I'll pass the mic back. Awesome. Dr. Wright? Uh, I was going to make a different point first, but I wanted to echo something Dr. Wilson said. In our previous study in Oklahoma, EPA Region 6 actually tried to shut us down because they weren't happy that we were doing research there because they thought we were in cahoots with a community group that they didn't uh, appreciate. But um, the, the, actually, to, to talk about omics, the, the omic that I think we sometimes forget about is phenomics. And um, earlier today, you know, when I saw Dr. Sheets uh, speak, Nikki Sheets, uh, he talked about cumulative impacts. and, and um, cumulative exposures. But you know, a lot of times when we do these studies, we get very focused on the risk assessment for cancer, the risk assessment for some other disease without considering that, you know, you can have a, an exposure cause actually multiple diseases. And also the disease itself can be part of the pathway. For example, if a, a exposure is an obesogen, the obesogen, the obesity causes diabetes, the diabetes causes heart disease. If there's lead, that can cause hypertension, hypertension causes heart disease. And we tend to study the diseases as if they're independent of each other. And what I'd really like to see is risk assessments that stop parsing out the disease and instead of saying, well, there's only this much cancer, well, there's this much cancer, there's this much heart disease, there's this much diabetes, and then and the cumulative number of cases actually may be uh, more easily or more statistically powerfully related to the exposure than any individual disease. So I would actually urge us to create methods to think about the links between these diseases and the exposures and not think of the diseases as being independent. We think of the exposures as mixtures, but in fact, the outcomes are also mixtures, but we rarely think of them that way. Awesome. Dr. Zoto? Um, just a couple of points to, I think, to, to build off one. I mean, one from a regulatory perspective, right? So can kind of these earlier perturbations that, um, you know, that pre, maybe preclinical per perturbations that are you know, we're, we're more well equipped to pick up with, with exposome measures. Can, you know, how can they make the, like, how can we 
integrate those into the regulatory process because right there has been a lot of resistance to that and just resistance to using human epidemiologic data in the regulatory process, especially through EPA. So I think there, there's an opportunity there. Um, also wondering, you know, is there ways to integrate exposome measurements into our intervention studies? Um, you know, whether those are, you know, um, you know, looking at policy interventions, uh, lifestyle interventions, uh, you know, changes in industry practice. Um, that I think that could be another powerful set of data. Um, I think one thing that um, I, I think we need to show caution about when it comes to exposome studies is they become, right, they're so molecular that it can, it tends to kind of individualize the situation, right? It's a lot of focus on what's going on in the individual. And so then I think there has been less kind of connecting factors, let's just say like structural racism or residential racial segregation with exposome measures. And so, be, and it's very hard to do, right? To think about these kind of multi-levels, multi-scalar approaches um, in, in kind of one set of studies. But I mean, if we don't, I think we can end up uh, pathologizing black bodies, you know, putting more emphasis on these kind of lifestyle factors just because they're easier to measure um, and, and to couple with kind of exposome measures, then kind of some of the social structural factors. And, um, and so we published a piece last year called the Intersectionality Exposome, where we're kind of pushing the field to to, to think about critical frameworks like intersectionality, which has kind of more been used in, you know, the social sciences, social psychology, and kind of used more in kind of qualitative data to find ways to kind of marry that with kind of our ideas of the exposome. Great, thank you. Dr. Dickerson? Well, one of the things that I didn't mention when I introduced myself, unfortunately, is that I used to work at the EPA. I used to work on those cumulative risk assessments. It was only for a year um, before I realized that that wasn't the best use of my time. But as somebody who has worked on those assessments, one of the biggest issues that I noticed with trying to do uh, a cumulative risk assessment was publication bias. We were really only bringing in a bunch of papers that were published. And if someone's paper wasn't published because it had a smaller sample size or because you know, the results weren't necessarily sexy, then we didn't get to include it in our risk assessment. Um, the other issue is that a, a lot of these papers focus on these point exposures. So if you were exposed last year, do you have the disease now? And we know, uh, especially with the exposome, that a lot of toxicants can store in the body. They bioaccumulate, not, not only in the food, but uh, they store up in the bone and in the fat. So when you think about lead, for an example, lead can store up in the bone for decades. And so, um, you know, it's, it's hard to, to look at outcomes 30 years later based on what a child was exposed to when they were two years of age. I think that's one of the greatest issues with environmental justice is that when people remove an exposure, they think, great, we fixed it, it's done. Now you can leave us alone, right? But just because you moved, removed lead pipes or because you got rid of a hog farm, the damage is already done. It's already stored in the fat, it's already stored in the bone. And when a woman is pregnant during her third trimester, those toxicants will remobilize. When someone ages, um, as the bone begins to metabolize, it'll also remobilize. And all of those things can, can cause more insults, uh, not just when someone is exposed, but much later in life. And, and I'm hoping that we will have the tools to, to better investigate uh, those, those kinds of um, life course exposures for cumulative risk assessment. So Dr. Dick Dickerson, you just mentioned a lot of the complexities that we're um, all concerned about, familiar with, and you've also mentioned at the start of your response that you didn't wanna waste your time. And so I'm wondering if, um, if there are opportunities for the tools and approaches we've already discussed to 
uh, address and inform primordial or primary prevention instead of continuing to investigate the sort of consequences of these clearly adverse exposures and illuminating biological mechanisms. I wonder if we can start to think about, well, what are the uh, environmental and social conditions necessary to uh, support optimal health. That is the definition of health equity. And I find that definition to be sort of inspirational and um, instructive. And so instead of spending our limited energy on um, delineating all of these complexities that really stretch the human brain beyond its capacity, what could we be doing um, or how could we leverage these technologies and opportunities to inform primordial or primary prevention with primordial prevention being considered uh, avoiding the risk factors from developing in the first place? And that question is open for anyone. I mean, I think that highlights the importance of team science, not necessarily team science, but teams in general. So we can't just pump out all of this research. Um, you have to work with people to make sure that that evidence that you find is disseminated, not just to politicians, but to also the community members and that once that evidence is disseminated, we try to address um, how to fix it. I can see Dr. Wilson wants to say something. He, mm -hmm. he is. Wiggling, is it on my tiny. face, Dr. Dickinson? Is it on my... <laughs> I, I'm too obvious. I cannot play poker. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm, no, I'm no, getting... no. I want you to, to go ahead because you need to get it out. You say it. He's so bad. <laughs> I, my face is so bad, too. No, I was just, when you asked that question, thank you, Dr. Dickinson. That I'm so, you're, I applaud you for giving me, passing the mic to me. So if you asked that question, Dr. Jackson, I think that's the point. <laughs> that's, the, that's the question. I, as someone who, I mentioned I do empowerment and liberation science, communities I deal with are kind of tired of some of the stuff that we're even talking about, to be honest. Clean the air, clean the water, give people access to safe food, safe housing. Empowerment science, liberation science. Antinostic talks about salute genesis. How you promote health, well-being, and quality life across all dimensions of the environment. Systems approach, built environment, natural environment, economic environment, political environment, social environment, spiritual environment. So the folks I work with, they would say that's where the work should be. That's where our federal dollars should be invested in instead of trying to get, send what's wrong with our genes, Levi genes, Jordan's genes, whatever, Lee genes, whatever genes you want to talk about. Talk to community folk. Like they're saying we need to shift from where we're talking about here. We need to do more on cumulative impacts, just keep the risk. But when it comes to real, they want to see solution science, action science, uh, change science. And my signature, it says, the people's money should be used for the people's research to get to the people's solutions. They want solutions, y'all. And so, and part of the future casting, we need to be casting about solutions, about systems, about creating healthy community ecosystems. And so I could go on and on, but that to me, that's the that's the place where we spend more time on. And in the biomedical model, I appreciate a lot of this, but that's not what folks want. Reduction is not what folks want to hear about. They want to hear about how you, you address the problem. Dr. Zoda alluded to it. She mentioned that alluded. She said it. So we're, when are we going to get to these solutions, folks? Talk to any EJ folks. Talk to any folks dealing with these cumulative exposures. And if this conversation is not about investing in solutions, real change, then they're, they're saying we're not doing enough. And we're still having the same old conversation. I'll, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, dear Dr. Dixon, because you saw my, my, my excitement. Dr. Wright? I, I, I like what Sakobi just said. I think in the end, it's about clean water, healthy food, clean air, and good schools. And if you give people that, quite frankly, maybe you don't even need to clean up the hog farm because if you, people had that, they'd be resistant to whatever the hog farm was doing. And it's and those are the issues that never seem to change, but those are the most important issues. Great, um, any other comments? Okay, so we're now getting into uh, Can I say one more thing? Yeah, I would just say, I mean, I think uh, Shakobi said it very well. Um, and, and so I don't think there's that much more to add, but I just wanted to say, you know, I think there are some inspiring researchers that are really trying to do solutions oriented research um, that we can learn from. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about like Dr. Dr. Eugenia South in Philly, 
who's doing all this great work in cleaning up lots um, and vacant lots and actually connecting it to reductions in gun violence. And so I think also thinking more expansively around, you know, when we do these solutions oriented projects or efforts on like, you know, the positive ripple effects, right? So thinking aspirationally about, you know, kind of what, you know, what kind of health equity could really look like, what that vision of health equity could look like. Um, so, um, so I, I, you know, I found that work um, really aspirational because probably if she had told people that cleaning up vacant lots would have an impact on gun violence, I'm sure so many people probably told her that, you know, that is irrational. But, um, you know, she's done the work, she showed with qu quantitative data, you know, these impressive outcomes. So, um, um, and, and, and I think kind of having those visionary models takes, um, you know, having strong conceptual models, systems-based approaches that, that have to be informed by the communities that we work with. They have to lead that work. Um, and I even think in when we, in our kind of conceptualization of the exposome, uh, right, which is really in its broadest sense, the totality of exposures across the life course. I mean, that also should be informed by, you know, community engagement, the communities that we're working with. I mean, I just think about the hog farms and, you know, odor is such a huge issue, right? A huge health effect, quality of life issue. And probably for a lot of researchers, that wasn't something that came came to mind as something to study, but you know, was born, you know, came from 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 talking to to impacted communities. So even I think our notion of the exposome, um, it, you know, there need there's room for a lot more bi-directional communication there. Well, can I jump in real quick just to, just to, just to add. And, and going with Dr. Zotis was saying, just the positive exposures too. We think about exposure science. The solution genesis is, is about positive exposures. So when it comes to solutions, how are we talking about, we talk about cumulative impacts, but usually we talk about the cumulative impacts in terms of negative impacts. What's the cumulative impacts of positive salutogenic exposures? I think that's an important part of the of the work that we need to we need to kind of, as part of the future cast, as part of the shift. Uh, and, and, and Dr. Warris is not here, but I think the public health exposed on paper that, that I'm also co-author on that paper is something that, that can provide some uh, insight into some of that too. So I just want to share it. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Sure, Dr. Dickerson. I'm just going to make one last comment on this. So I submitted a, a grant proposal a while ago, also trying to look at blight reduction and violence reduction. And as Dr. Zoda mentioned, the, the reviewers were like, no, that's nonsense. So it's important that if we're trying to fund these um, solutions-based projects, that we kind of need some buy-in from the funding agencies um, and from the reviewers who are looking at the grants for these funding agencies. So we just kind of need a, a bit of a paradigm shift on where the funding is going, because as an academic, I have to fund my own salary. Now, yes, we can, we can hope that health departments can try to mitigate some of these things. But uh, when you're thinking about just rigorous research, a lot of times that does come from academic institutions and we need the funding to back these solutions-based projects. Awesome response, thank you. And so we're going down the line of considering all the challenges. And I can't help but think about how acquiring data is uh, insufficient to affect change and certainly political will on a number of, of levels uh, is often needed. And so I'm wondering the thoughts of the panelists regarding how uh, we can garner political will to take um, on these environmental justice issues with a greater sense of urgency. Um, and so considering how data is often enough, we can think about um, coronavirus uh, pandemic. And there's some recent data that was published suggesting that once uh, folks realized that COVID was disproportionately affecting a minoritized groups, uh, then uh, concerns were less, uh, uh, 
what they call restrictions, but really protections were lessened and people had reduced empathy. And so this is a part of the social conditions that influence what is prioritized and what is not. So I'm wondering if anyone has thoughts uh, centering around how we can garner greater political will um, in order to um, advance environmental injustices research in efforts. Okay, I'll start. Um, so um, I think coalition building is really, really key to this, right? Because when 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 you can kind of, you know, mentally when people say, oh, that's not my problem, right? Then, uh, then they're less likely to be invested in solutions. Um, and I, I, and so I think kind of building coalitions um, and kind of helping kind of make the case of why, you know, um, lead, you know, in water, in drinking water is a problem for everybody um, or for multiple kind of powerful stakeholders is, is really important and kind of, I can just give one example from my work when I was a postdoc at UCSF working on chemical flame retardants. They were particularly elevated in California homes and people and a lot of it had been linked back to these, um, you know, old um, furniture flammability standards, which weren't evidence based, which, you know, was really because the chemical industry and the tobacco industry were in cahoots. They didn't, the fires were because people were smoking indoors, but they're like, let's try to make the furniture less flammable. And they started putting all these flame retardants in that migrated out of the furniture and into the dust and into people's bodies. And then um, and, you know, there were um, many attempts to change legislation and, you know, I provided informational testimonies so many times um, that went nowhere. And it wasn't until, um, you know, a coalition was developed that included firefighters. So they were really, really key, powerful advocates, right? They were kind of like an unlikely ally, health professionals, children's health advocates, um, we also kind of did a lot of work to get, um, at, you know, EJ um, organizations on board because, you know, these flame retardants were were higher in black and brown children. And we knew that the flame retardants really had adverse impacts on children's health. And so we were really also making the case for like, here is a way to protect the health and development of, of all kids. Um, and it was, you know, that 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 coalition was was really powerful. And um and also engaging with the media. So that is also why I constantly come back to this communication translation thing, because there was all this great work done, but then when the Chicago Tribune did their five-part series, that was actually really what got the governor um, to change his mind. Um, so, so I think media uh, and influencers need to be part of this uh, coalition, these coalitions as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be succinct, but Dr. Zoda said a lot of great stuff. I want to piggyback off a few things. Uh, for example, on the, on the coalition building uh, that Dr. Zoda mentioned, I, I'm a co-founder of the Mid-Atlantic Justice Coalition. Uh, it's it's Mid-Atlantic Environmental Economic Justice Coalition. So we have EJ groups, advocacy groups, green groups, Delaware, uh, Maryland, DC, and Virginia. And so we've been working together as a region to try to advance environmental economic justice and put the economy back into the hands of people. And so that's part of what we've been doing. We've, been, we've had a legislator work group uh, in 2020, the legislative worker, we work with legislators on bills that co that work group led to the refounding of of the DMV EJ coalition, which we found in 20, 2012, which is now this new coalition. Uh, Dr. Zoda's point about media, I think is very, very important. Uh, I think, as y'all many of you heard me say, I'll say for y'all my Yoda statement, uh, peer review publication is not science communication make. No, no public politician, no community member cares about your peer review publication. That's important for you. That's not really important for them. If you're going to if you're going to present your your report back to community folks it needs to be a white paper or, uh, it needs to be a, a, a data story map it could be a fact sheet it needs to be a blog maybe blog. So some folks like blogs you'd be using the old media you know radio and tv be using new media you need to be facebooking uh instagramming uh, uh twittering and TikToking. right we got to get science communication to the hands of the way people uh get it right and know, knowing your audience so I think Dr. Zola's point is very, very, you know, that's a very powerful point. And, and I also think, you know, you know, when you think about this moving the political groups, no politician goes to politician school. So who who's talking to them? If the if the community members are not talking to them, 
They're, they're having business and industry and other folks talk to them. So we have to have a seat at the table when we engage with policymakers. So one last point, one of the things that we're trying to do is we just released a, 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 a legislative scorecard, environmentalist scorecard, the only the second one in the country. CJ has one in California to, to score our legislators on how they're working on environmental justice issues in the state of Maryland, how they're voting on bills. And then also we, because I built Maryland EJ screen, we also have for the legislative district what's their EJ score. So then now community members can say, hey, what you're doing on EJ? You got a terrible score, but we're in the 99 percentile in the state of Maryland, right? So that's something that folks can use to advocate around to push, to push their legislators to do more. And also, we have an agency scorecard. So we're judging uh, nine eight, eight agencies in the state of Maryland on what they're doing is least to integrate environmental justice into their policies and programs. That's going to come out next month. So that's another opportunity for community members to push their agencies on how they're addressing environmental justice. And so I just want to share uh, those two tools as uh, ways we can move forward about pushing the political folks and also our agencies to do more. Thank you. Dr. Dickerson. Uh, thank you. So one of the things that I always point out is that justice movements are often formed by the youth. Anybody who works on a college campus has seen how students can mobilize quickly when they want to advocate for something, right? So I try to convince the youth of the community that environmental justice is something that they should pick up. Um, I've been working with the student, Azita Amiri, uh, who's with one of the Bloomberg American Health Initiative fellows, and she's been working in North Alabama to try to, one, train high school students on how to do environmental tests, and then two, have them work with politicians to advocate for their communities. That's one thing, but the other thing that I always point out is that you have to vote in your local elections. It's these city council officials that are the ones that are approving these licenses to build and things like that. And oftentimes when I talk to communities, they say, you know, I sent a message to the EPA. You went a little too high up. You have to stay in your community because it's better to try to work with your community politicians to keep those facilities from being built in the first place, rather than trying to go to the EPA later on to try to get them to clean up some environmental disaster. Even when they clean it up, you have to make sure that they don't just throw everything into a barrel and bury it in your backyard. So it's better to try to attack it from the beginning. Uh, it's better to have advocates and it's it's a little easier to get advocates who are youthful and vigorous. I agree, Dr. Wright. Um, I just had a question really for the group. Um, I'm too old for social media. I never did Facebook, I never did anything. I don't understand TikTok. Um, and I understand that, the, that there's an energy in youth and there's also the ability to connect through social media, but there's a lot of people like me. There's a lot of people who are older who are not very savvy at it and quite honestly are not interested in it. So how do we reach them? I, I mean, I think part of this is um, really kind of understanding like, well, I'm having an idea of who are you trying to reach? And, um, and then what are the best ways to reach them, right? And so uh, I think it's, uh, it you know, there are people that kind of have this knowledge base. I, I think traditional media is still a really powerful tool. And it's like social media is almost complementary to traditional media. And I mean, like we published a paper on fast food and phthalates that you know, was covered in Washington Post and USA Today and so forth. And we had two, uh, we had a senator, Diane, Dr. I mean, senator Feinstein's office reached out to us and um, somebody in the House Oversight Committee reached out to us because they read about it in the Washington Post, right? And so uh, I think there is still a role for traditional media for people, um, you know, who um, don't, may not be on social media, but I think even if you think about these policymakers, even if they're not active on uh, social media, they have staffers and research assistants and other people, you know, who, who know whose job it is, is to be kind of seeing kind of, uh, you know, what things may, may be trending. So I think, I think it's kind of helpful to really take, like, th be strategic about it. 
and really think about like, what are the goals you're trying to accomplish? Who are you trying to reach? And kind of what are the different ways to, to kind of, to, you know, accomplish these goals or reach, or reach your, your key stakeholders. Um, so I'll just stop there. Excellent. Yeah, just, cool. yeah, just add to that. I, sorry, I had to jump real quick, come back. But yeah, you got to know your audience. So one, I just had a conversation today with uh, one of the NPR stations about doing stuff on from the NPR. Because some folks listen to the radio. You know, they, some, some people, you know, they don't do social media. So I think knowing your audience is very important. But my point, my earlier point was there's different communication modalities. If you're going to get to your specific audience, you didn't know your audience well enough to know which modalities that they use and what and which ways they can receive the information. So it's not just the modalities, but what are the forms of information and who are the and who are the messengers too? So there's multiple points of science communication that we have to be aware of. And I would say that that's probably as, as part of this future cast, as Dr. Zoda mentioned, that's probably a, that's one of the biggest, in my opinion, area areas of need. And so many of us are not trained to do good science communication. When we, when do you get, I mean, Dr. Zoda has a great program, but when did you get great science communication trained? Do we have a science communication class? There's no, I mean, maybe we will. Maybe my point is maybe we should have classes. Uh, and maybe it's not good enough to say, well, I, you know, I, I'll say this to myself, I can, you know, uh, project. I'm a scientist. I, I publish. That's all I do. Well, you should be required to do more. We should be trained to do better. Right, so we can't fall back on that anymore. Reporting back to communities and our and our policymakers is a big part, of, I think, of the responsibility and accountability of scientists. So I'll, I'll stop there. Can I, can I just add? To, oh, sorry. Can I just add to that? I think, especially because this is a panel about environmental justice, we we have to also do better in increasing the accessibility of our information. I mean, so one thing is just right, getting it into, you know, kind of open source, open access information, you know, changing the language, but, you know, like making things available in Spanish, right? Especially for a lot of the communities and the issues we're working with, you know, this is a big barrier. Another thing that the, the Agents of Change fellows have made me realize is thinking about disability, right? So like with our podcast, we now, you know, provide text for all the, you know, for all the audio translations, just with an eye towards um, inclusivity. Um, and so I think when we're um, talking particularly around issues of EJ, we, we, we always have to think about, um, you know, who, who are we ignoring or who, and who are we leaving out or who else could benefit from this information? I think that's where I was getting at. I, I worry that social media is sort of analogous to multiomics. We, you know, these really fancy high, and, and you know, I run a here lab, uh, these really fancy high throughput, you know, high dimensional assays are the bright, shiny object everybody wants to do. And then I, I worry that in, you know, science communication, social media is the bright, shiny object, and it leaves certain people behind. Uh, per, I think about, you know, my mother who, who passed away recently, the, I could never reach her by social media. I tried desperately to teach her how to use Skype so I could have a, you know, a, a video call with her and it never worked. And I don't know what the right answer is, but there is a generation of people for whom technology is very, very difficult. My mother was an immigrant as well. So language was also a barrier for her. So there, there are just, you know, there are so many issues that I worry that we leave people behind because they're not part of social media. Okay, so, you know, I'm going to take us back to considering all the opportunities across the entire research spectrum. And I'm curious to know, um, in the next 10 years, what are the most pressing um, research opportunities and actions uh, that would help the exposome um, advanced environmental uh, justice efforts. And so what can scientists do now or within the next 10 years that would be of maximum benefit? On the summary real quick, um, just in general, as I said earlier in my introduction, I'm, I'm a fan proponent of community science. So training more community scientists, I think is gonna be really, really important, particularly from an environmental justice perspective. Principles five and seven, you don't know, you don't know the 17 principles of environmental justice. I'm gonna just go talk about principles five and seven, self-determination, uh, communities engaged in all stages, you know, decision-making. And so to me, you, we may need to make sure that folks are 
they have their own scientific tools. They can do their own research, right? Exposure research. So training more community members who come from frontline fence communities who have these issues, whether it be uh, traditional or non-traditional training, whether it be two-year college, four-year college, getting degrees, or just community training programs. I think that's what we need to have, more folks who actually had lived experience, contextual experience, being trained, and, and value that lived experience, those community cultural model systems, and that work driving the work we do, because that going to be folks who are going to be really in, interested in solutions. I come from a community that, with a landfill, with a sewage treatment plant, right, with a highway. There's other folks I know who come from these communities. These folks will be really interested in doing the rigorous, the best science, and getting to the best solutions. So I think that's where we need to be going. Great. I think the future has a lot of opportunities as well for community-based research. I think um, sensors are going to be a big part going forward. I think community sensors, I think wearable devices, letting people crowdsource odors and, and um, noise pollution in their neighborhoods. I think um, mapping is getting a lot easier. You don't have to be a programmer to create maps, and you can probably go to a library uh, and actually start to create maps using EPA. I think we can train folks on how, what the resources are and what the software is they need to make maps so they can see where the pollution is in their community. We can see the air quality and the water quality data in their communities. I think, I think that's what the future is going to be. Uh, I think, you know, it, it's actually going to be much easier, I, th I would argue, for communities in the next five to 10 years, as long as we do our role in helping them uh, pointing them in the right direction to how to use these tools and how to acquire these tools, because the tools are getting more and more sophisticated at some level, but they're also getting easier to employ at other levels. So it is it is becoming, I think, a more just world in that way. So hopefully that's what I hope is going to happen in the next five to 10 years. Excellent point. I actually have spent a lot of time wondering why we haven't leveraged apps like um, the, the neighborhood apps that many people have already connected to, to communicate with policymakers or other decision makers regarding what issues there might be in local um, communities, because they could be fixed quite readily um, if they're identified by community members who are constituents of the individuals who want to remain in a leadership position. So it seemed like low hanging fruit and currently a missed opportunity to take action. And perhaps researchers could evaluate the effectiveness of that sort of uh, approach. And so Dr. Wilson, were you going to- Yes, I was gonna respond to your question. Thank you, you set me up well. So I'm gonna connect two things. This is a great discussion. I got three. I'm, I'm triple booked right now. So I'm supposed to be in like two other meetings right now, right? Like 2.30. I'm supposed to be in two other meetings. But the point is, I have this app called My Block Counts, which you just said, Dr. Jackson, where you get very granular data. And going back to Dr. Wright's comment, too, I'm going to connect a couple of points. Very granular data at the block level. So the idea is you can you can be used as part of decision support tools to say almost like a 411. This is what's going on in my community. When it, we have eight to 10 different categories around infrastructure, housing, you know, uh, food, you know, uh, in, uh, schools, also uh, social disorders, et cetera. And, and so we're building this app out. And then if the app will be connected to Dr. Wright's point. It'll be connected to Maryland EJ screen. So we better geolocate this data and have it mapped at the block level when our Maryland EJ screen tool. And this, uh, as a quick FYI, our Maryland EJ screen tool, when it, when it gets updated and released in a couple months, It'll be able to, you will be able to map and uh, create cumulative impact uh, EJ scores at the track level, block group level, block level, legislative district level, and school district level. Plus, we have this block data. Plus, going back to Dr. Wright's point, we also build a hyper local air quality monitor networks, Dr. Wright. So, we're going to have a real time air quality interface in our mapping tool, too. So, you have the block data and the air quality data in the tool. And so, this is one app that we're developing. We're also developing other apps around uh, park access. Uh, park equity mapping, a tool that we have, we're building an app for that, and we're building apps related to uh, other types of apps as well. So I think this tool is something that we're getting funding from Environmental Defense Fund and some other sources. It should be, it, it should roll out in a couple months, but I'm really excited about the tool, and I think it's something that uh, can be really useful to communities collect, it's, and it's very easy to use, y'all. So I'll talk more about that, but thank you, Dr. Jackson, for that question, and I'll stop talking because I'm excited about that too, but I'm passing the mic back. Thank you. Awesome. Dr. Dickerson? So my thought is you only know what you know. I tell students that all the time. A lot of times you think you know a lot until somebody tells you something else. It's like, oh, I didn't even know I could do that. 
And what I found is when I do um, community panels and things like that, a lot of people have no idea what publicly available resources there are just to figure out what's going on in their communities. A lot of people don't know about the EPA's EJ screening tool. Uh, there's a tool that one of my colleagues at Johns Hopkins, uh, Jamie uh, Madrigano, has developed. And I think it's really just the importance of spreading information in a helpful way. If we learned, well, we learned a lot from COVID. Let me not say if we didn't learn anything, but one of the things that we learned from COVID is that you have to be able to disseminate information and able for, uh, for people to, to educate themselves. Um, in addition to just publicly available resources, a lot of people are unaware that you can test your own water. You can usually get those kits for free from your local health department. And I'm always advocating for um, letting people know where they can get access to air pollution data. So there are a few community-based air pollution monitors that have been placed around Baltimore City, um, specifically by Kirsten Kohler. And she's providing access to this air pollution data. It's just a matter of who knows it. And, um, and so I just want to harp on the importance of spreading awareness of resources. There are a lot that people are just not aware of. And maybe maybe social media is, is the way to do that or media, the regular media as well. Excellent. Dr. Zothar? Yeah, I'm just, I think building on what Dr. Wright and Dr. Wilson were talking about, um, it seems like, I mean, I completely agree with Dr. Wilson that community-led science is, it's, I think it's it's the way that it has to be done, and there's a lot of work to be done, and there's um, a lot, you know, a, a lot of um, you know, kind of promising tools that are emerging. But one that you know still seems to be lacking, right? We're having this this the whole point of this this panel is the exposome. Is there's not really easy ways for communities to actually do biomonitoring or measure biological markers, um, you know, that, that, that we're talking about. And so a lot of the sensors and a lot of the kind of tools right now available, you know, are useful for air monitoring or knowing kind of what industries are um, near in your neighborhood and, and, and or even noise monitoring. But, um, you know, when it still comes to kind of what becomes biologically embodied, you know, those assays are really expensive and um, out of reach. And so I think that is kind of a barrier that somehow needs to be addressed uh, to kind of fully realize the community science model. And um, um, because that data can be so powerful and, and gets you closer to di right, disease, which, you know, kind of um, has impact for a lot of people in decision making. Um, um, it, and the other thing I just want to say about kind of the why community science is so important and community led science is so important is because I think one thing we haven't really talked about that COVID has showed us is that there is a lot of distrust in scientific and medical institutions. And actually, this is, seems like it's almost going in the wrong dis direction, right? It seems like almost that kind of the distrust and skeptica, skepticism of these institutions is increasing as we've seen with the vaccine rollout. And I think part of this is, you know, you think about black and brown communities, there is historical and contemporary, um, uh, I mean, ex exploitation at times by scientific and medical establishments. And I think also a lot of people just don't see themselves reflected in these institutions and they feel very removed from these institutions. And so I think if we also invest in community training, scientific programs and, um, and engage them in the kind of data generation and interpretation process, that um, it can also potentially kind of um, connect people back to the value of these institutions, because you know if 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 the general public does not believe it, you know, in the credibility and value of these institutions, then we can do great work, but you know it won't be um, you know as useful as it as it could be. And so, I mean, I think as I think we as scientists have to contend with that with that more, just as we have to contend with the epidemic of misinformation, which nobody seems to really be talking about or trying to teach our students on how to navigate or, 
or think about this, you know, these are kind of emerging issues that, you know, we have to kind of get in front of. Excellent. So we actually have just five more minutes left. And I know Dr. Wilson and Dr. Wright wanted to um, provide a response. And so I'll ask you to add uh, any commentary to your closing remarks after I ask this last question. So you might want to integrate what you were going to say in your response to this question. So I'm wondering how we can uh, support toxicologists, epidemiologists, and so forth in moving towards more um, ethical engagement with communities um, and have the teams that uh, ethically advance use the emerging tools in order to advance the science. Um, so I'm unsure if you want to respond, Dr. Wilson or Dr. Wayne. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and jump in. Thank you for that question. I, I think doc Dr. Zoda hit on a few of the points uh, in, in regards to this question, you know, when we're, when we're talking about, you know, partnerships and doing work with communities, I think in general, the, the ethics of it, you know, you have to build relationships, you know, you know, what, what are the great ingredients of a relationship, trust, you know, you know, uh, respect, you know, Dr. Dr. Zoda mentioned some, some baggage, we all bring baggage uh, into a partnership when you come from an academic institution, just in general, not just not your individual baggage, but the university baggage, you know, so you, those are things that you have to be aware of when you're trying to build relationships with communities. And what you did well in one community doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work well in, in another community. So, so I think you know the Dr. Zola's point about the community science part. You know, I, I think I said earlier anybody can be a scientist. So what we the idea is how can we make sure we're increasing scientific literacy and trust in science by connecting to communities. I think that's part of what we have to do with the epidemiologists and toxicologists. And then in addition to that, when you think about the ethics of doing this work, you got to you got to make it every day. You got to make it pocketbook. You got to make it proximal. You got to connect the issues you work on, y'all, the food, faith, family, health and jobs. You got to connect to the stuff that's important to folks. OK, and so how are you connecting the omics, the technology and its use? What's the what's the what's the uh, impact and utility of that work to, to the actual communities that are impacted by the issues? So you got to have a solutions as part of your continuing work. You got to have a solutions piece of that work. It just can't be the discovery science. There has to be a component where you have good investment in engagement and good investment in solutions. So, so just I know I'm talking too much, but just to kind of conclude, hopefully I conclude in the next thirty seconds or twenty five seconds. Uh, I think it's going to be important to build those relationships and, and put the community first. Right? Your questions are important, but when it comes to environmental justice issues. Meaningful involvement, meaningful engagement in principles five and seven, that has to be at the top of your kind of uh, list of things to do to make sure those community voices are heard. And if you do that and understand the baggage and build the trust and respect and have solutions, you know, talking about solutions and application, I think that's something that uh, will be beneficial to you individually and also to those communities that you're trying to serve. So making sure we're doing science that serves. So that's one of the other points I'm going to make when Dr. Zoda started talking. She reminded me, science that serves. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Absolutely. Dr. Wright? Hopefully my dog will be settled. Uh, sorry about that. Um, uh, that the, the, I, I just will add um, to about what, what do toxicologists and epidemiologists need. You know, when I think about genomics and why it's been such a powerful force, whether or not it's been a force for change, I think is very debatable, but it's certainly been a powerful force in science. And you know, there was an enormous investment in giving researchers a tool to understand uh, genomics. So there's websites like the on, online Mendelian OMIM, online Mendelian Inheritance in Man. There's, there's database repositories like dbGaP and GEO, and there's all kinds of resources to help you understand the data. That doesn't exist in exposomics. What I would really like to see is NIH make even one-tenth the investment in trying to understand the exposome. And when I say the exposome, I don't mean just the chemical, but also the physical, the social, and the nutritional, and its geospatial distribution across the United States, which will almost certainly uh, correlate with health inequities, and also life stage differences. And until we make that investment so that we actually have the tools to actually interpret ex exposomic data, it's gonna be really hard when you measure 10,000 things to know what's important and what's not. We have to make that foundational investment 
in those sorts of databases that will help us understand what it is we're measuring. That is uh, the perfect charge to conclude uh, this session with. Um, I'd like to thank all of the panelists for such an excellent and informative discussion. We hope that it's translated into action in the short term. Um, and I'd also like to thank the audience for the engagement. And so this actually concludes our wonderful session on the exposome and population health for environmental justice. And we'll actually take a break and return at 3 p.m. So um, we can have a dialogue on climate change and health.